story of creation. Once upon a time, before this world was created, there was just empty darkness everywhere. In this vast, never-ending darkness, there lived two gods, Tepeu the Maker and Pukumats the Feathered Spirit. They were pretty bored as there was no one in the universe to worship them. So one day, they came together and decided that they would create the world. It was quite an easy task for them to do. All they had to do was just think. When they thought, Earth, a huge pile of land started taking form in the darkness. They flew over this land and thought, mountains and valleys. Suddenly, large mountains arose from this pile of land and huge valleys were formed. They thought pine trees, water, and the sky. As soon as they thought them, they appeared in an instant, and thus the earth was formed. They were very happy with what they had done so far. Tepeu and Gukumats then decided to create animals and other creatures to praise their names and to look after their creation. The animals appeared on Earth one by one. The deer, the ant, the birds, the serpent, and so on. Now praise us, say our names, commanded the creators. Naturally, the animals could only bark or grunt or howl. The noise was so deafening that Tepeu and Gukumats ordered them to stop. How could the animals worship the gods when they could not even speak? The spirits were disappointed and they decided to create better beings who could say their names and worship them properly. Tepeu and Gukumats started experimenting, creating humans. The first humans were made using clay. The gods were happy with their work, and they gave the clay figure life. However, their heads wouldn't turn, and their faces were lopsided. Whenever they tried to speak, they kept falling apart. This was a disaster. The gods then started creating humans using wood. This batch of mankind proved somewhat more successful as they could talk. They were also stronger, able to walk and talk and multiply. These men had no memory or emotions though. How could they worship their makers when they had no minds and their heart was empty? The words that came out of them were just as empty and meaningless. Tepeu and Gukumats didn't like what they had created. The gods decided to destroy the wood humans by sending a hurricane. It rained for days and nights, and soon the earth was flooded with water. Most of the wooden people were destroyed in the flood, but some of them managed to escape by running into the forest. The few who managed to escape by remaining in the woods later became monkeys. The gods decided to leave them as monkeys to set an example for the future humans. Tepeu and Gukumats greatly desired to create a successful race of human beings who could worship them properly. To ensure that this third and final experiment was successful, the gods sent four animals, a fox, a parrot, a coyote, and a crow to find an ideal location for their next attempt. After a few days, the animals brought with them a stack of white corn, which grew on the far end of the earth. Tepeu and Gukumats first ground this maize into a paste. Then they molded human beings out of this paste to make the first four individual men. They were known as mother fathers as they represented both the female and male beings of the human race. 
these yeah. mother fathers were That's an nice. instant success as they could express themselves and understand the world around them. As soon as they were awake, they worshipped Tepeyu and Gukumats and thanked them for their lives. Tepeyu and Gukumats were pleased with their creation. They had achieved what they wanted. What do you see? They asked the men. We can see everything, replied the men. It was true. They could see through the rocks, the mountains, and to the edges of the earth. They could see the God's entire creation, and they could even understand everything. That is not good for us, said the gods to each other, as they thought the humans would rival them someday. The gods clouded the humans' vision so that they could not see and understand all of their creation. After that, the humans could no longer see through the rocks and the mountains. They could only see things close to them. The humans now only had a limited understanding of the world. Then, the gods decided to make partners for them. While the men slept at night, four women were placed beside them. When the men finally woke up, they were amazed at the gods' creations. These first humans multiplied, and the population of the earth increased. There were dark-skinned and pale-skinned people. They started to travel and settled across different parts of the earth. And that, my friends, is the legend of creation in Mayan myths. Story of Creation by Aztec How Music Came to the World One day, the sky god, Tezcatlipoca, ruler of the universe, was walking the earth. He was enjoying the glorious mountains, the sea, but he felt as if there was something missing. He realized that this emptiness was because there was no music on earth. No one was singing, and no one played a note. The only sound to be heard was the sound of howling wind. He felt sorry for the people of earth. There were singers and musicians in heaven who played and sang all day. Everything about that music entertained the lives of the gods. Tezcatlipoca called upon the god of the winds, Quetzalcoatl. We need music on earth, he said. Music? said Quetzalcoatl. What does that have to do with me? I have no music. I know, the sky god said. But I'll tell you who does have it. The sun. He surrounds himself with singers and musicians, and he won't share their music with us. The world feels hopeless without sound. Go to the sun and ask him to send music to earth. We must find a way to brighten the people's lives. Quetzalcoatl felt sorry for the people as well, and he thought it would be a good idea to give music to the people of earth. Quetzalcoatl unfolded his wings and hurled himself into the air. He flew over land and sea, heading straight to the House of Sun. After many hours of flying, he finally reached the Land of Sun. He could see the shimmering towers in the distance, and he heard the sweet sound of music in the air. Quetzalcoatl followed the music and he soon arrived at the Palace of the Sun. The sun was surrounded by musicians of many colors, white and blue, gold and red. The music, like its color, was bright and soothing, or lyrical and sweet, or soft and passionate and filled with power. There was no sadness surrounding the sun. Suddenly, the sun saw Quetzalcoatl. Stop playing, he cried. Stop singing. It's that terrible wind god. 
don't even speak to him, or he will take you back to that silent planet of his. Naturally, the musicians obeyed. No one wanted to leave this palace of light and joy. Quetzalcoatl called, Musicians, come with me. None of them said a word or made any sound. The wind god lifted his wings and cried out again, Singers, musicians, the lord of the sky commands you to come with me. Come to earth and fill the world with your sound. No one answered Quetzalcoatl's cry. Everything remained silent. Quetzalcoatl did not like what was going on. He didn't like to be ignored. Quetzalcoatl then gathered all his strength and let out an enormous roar. His voice exploded all over the universe like a million hurricanes. Lightning cracked and a huge cloud was created, a cloud so vast that it covered the entire world. The clouds swirled around the house of the sun, turning the daylight into darkness. Soon, the sun was lost in the darkness of that great, powerful storm. The wind god roared as if there was no end to his voice. Everything fell down. The sun flickered like a tiny flame. With nowhere else to go, the musicians ran to Quetzalcoatl and huddled in his lap, trembling with fear. Instantly, Quetzalcoatl's anger passed. He kept each of them inside a box of different color. And carrying this box, he dived toward Earth. He felt like a father carrying his children home. As he dived, people on Earth looked up in anticipation. They felt something new was coming. They could see the colors beginning to glow. And the sight was so magnificent, they gushed with delight. The trees lifted their branches. The birds soared. Flowers opened and fruits ripened, and amidst all this beauty, the people began to cry out with delight. Quetzalcoatl gave the boxes to Tezcatlipoca, and as he did, the whole planet seemed to be waking from a long sleep. Tezcatlipoca opened that box, and the musicians came out of each box. They looked around curiously at the beautiful planet around them, all waiting to listen to their music. Then they began to play. They wandered through the valleys and deserts and oceans, filling the air with their glorious music. The people on Earth learned to play music too, and so did the birds, the trees, the fish, and every other creature. The earth was soon filled with music. Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca were both pleased. They made this planet brighter by giving them the music. How Music Came to the World Mayan Stories, the story of hero twins. Once upon a time, there lived two twin boys named One Hunabu and Seven Hunabu. They were the first generation of hero twins. These two boys loved to play the Maya ball game and they were very good at it. Onlookers cheered so loudly whenever the boys played ball that the noise attracted the attention of the Lords of Death. The Lords of Death lived in the underworld, also known as Shibalba. Now these gods had a strange hobby. They liked to trick people into dying. The Lords of Death 
sent a message to the brothers, praising their wonderful talent. The message included an invitation to play a ball game in the underworld. The brothers did not trust the lords of death. They couldn't ignore the invitation, as that would anger the lords as well. So one day, they set out for the underworld. They made it safely across the river of spikes. They made it safely across the river of blood. They made it safely across the river of pus. They finally arrived at the house of the Lords of Death. They saw a lord standing there waiting for them. What they didn't know was that this was just a wood statue to trick them. The boys greeted the lord without suspecting any foul play. And as soon as they did, the real lords appeared before them from hiding. Do you think we are just made of wood? The lords cried. The boys realized they had failed the test. They knew that they would be put to death if they failed two tests in the underworld. Then the gods asked them to sit down. When they sat down, they were burned by a fiery bench. This was another trick, and they had failed another test. Because they failed both the tests, the gods put them to death. Despite being dead, according to the myth, one Hunapu had a child with one of the Maya goddesses. This goddess had twins, who were to become known as the Hero Twins. Their names were Hunapu and Jibalonke. Just like their father and uncle, Hero Twins grew up to become great ballplayers too. They were also loud and annoyed the gods of the underworld. I thought we got rid of those noisy boys, snapped a lord. Soon, a messenger was sent with an invitation to play a game of ball in the underworld. The hero twins set off for the underworld. However, this time the boys had learned from their father's mistakes. When the boys arrived at the house of the lords, one of the lords was waiting to greet them, just like before. The boys knew that this was not a real lord. We will not greet a wooden dummy, they announced loudly. The real lords came out from hiding with a surprised look. You passed the test. They did not sound very happy when they said this. Now take a seat, said one lord, pointing at a bench. No thank you, replied the twins. We will stand. You passed the second test, said another lord. It was time for the actual ball game to begin, and this time the gods tried to trick the boys with a ball with sharp blades on it. When the boys saw the blades, they threatened they weren't going to play the game if the gods wouldn't play fair. The gods agreed to play fair. However, the boys knew that the gods intended to kill them if they won, so they let the gods win every time. What the lords did not know was that all this was the part of the twins' plans. The boys knew that they will not be let out of the underworld unless they died. So in the final match, the boys beat the lords of death. The lords were furious. They told the boys to jump into an oven, and the boys agreed. The boys were killed, and the gods threw their ashes into the river. This was again a part of the hero twins' secret plan. When their ashes became part of the magical river, the boys came back to life as catfish. And later, they were restored to as the hero twins. The hero twins now had many powers of the gods. They could kill things 
and then make them come back from the dead. They could burn a house down and then restore it to its original shape. The twins traveled from town to town, performing tricks for a living. The Lords of Death heard of their amazing act. They sent the twins an invitation to the underworld, not knowing that they were inviting the very twins they had killed so recently. They asked the boys to perform the trick on them. The twins happily agreed. After all, this was what they wanted all along. The Lords of Death stood before them, eagerly waiting and the twins, without hesitating, killed all of them. Only they did not put the lords back together again. The other lords knew they had been defeated. Rather than risk losing any more lords, they sent the twins back to earth. The gods of the heavens honored the courage and cleverness of the hero twins by bringing them up to the sky. One twin became the sun, the other became the moon, making them the rulers of the earth. Mayan Stories, the story of hero twins. The Legend of the Blue Bonnet. Once upon a time, there was a great famine. There was no rain day after day, month after month. The land was dying, the animals were dying, the people were dying. The Comanche people suffered a lot. The sight of their dear ones dying left them distraught. Among them lived a little girl named She who is all alone. Her mother and father, brothers and sisters, and grandparents had all died in the Great Famine. She was alone, so the people called her She Who Is All Alone. She Who Is All Alone had a doll. She loved the doll. Her father and her mother had made the doll for her. The eyes were painted with the juice of berries. The trousers were decorated with beads. The doll's hair was filled with the bright blue feathers of the bird who cries, J, J, J. She who is all alone carried the doll everywhere. She often thought of her father and mother, her brothers and sisters and grandparents. Now they were all just shadows. She only had the doll now to remind her of the glorious days. The dancers lined up and the drums were set. They started singing out loud. Great spirits, the land is dying. What have we done? What must we do? For three days, the dancers danced, but no rain came. They waited and waited, but with no success. The shaman went to the top of the hill. He asked the great spirits what the people must do. The shaman returned and spoke to the people gathered around the fire. The Great Spirit says the people have been selfish. They have taken from the earth and not given back to the earth. The people must now give to the earth their most precious possessions, burning them and giving the ashes to the four corners of the winds, north, south, east, and west. The famine will cease and life will be restored, said the shaman. The people sang, Not my new bow, no, no, not my new blanket, no, no, not my shining knife, no, no, not my new cooking pot, no, no, not my silent moccasins, no, no, not my beaded blouse, no, no. The shaman asked them to think it over, and everyone left. She who is all alone knew that the great spirits wanted her doll. She knew what she must do. She waited until it was dark, took a burning stick from the fire, 
and climbed to the top of the hill. She reached the place where the great spirits had spoken to the shaman. She gathered the twigs and started a fire. She looked up at the starlit sky and said, O oh, great spirit, here is my doll. It is all I have. Please accept it. Her eyes filled with tears as she thought of her family. Then she set her favorite doll on fire. She felt the pain of the twisting heat and the sting of the smoke. She watched the flames die. She waited silently beneath the sky of stars until the ashes were cold. Then she threw the ashes toward the homes of the four winds to the north, the south, the east, and the west. She lay down and fell asleep. In the morning, on waking, she found herself lying on blue flowers, as blue as the bird who sings, J, J, J. The ground was covered with these brilliant flowers where the ashes fell. They were the sign of forgiveness from the great spirits. The people saw the bright blue flowers on the hill and came to see them and found she who is all alone. And it began to rain, and the people sang and danced, and the grass and leaves grew, and the animals returned. The land lived again. From that day, the little girl was known as the one who loves her people. The Legend of the Blue Bonnet Once upon a time, the world was covered in darkness. Gods were still creating this world, and one god, the black god, was busy arranging the stars in the sky. These stars were meant to be a guide for people living on Earth. Black god took out a single bright star. He reached far out into the sky and carefully placed it precisely in the north. It became the North Star, the star that never moves, which guides the nighttime traveler. Next, he picked out seven stars and placed near the North Star. This constellation he called Revolving Male because it circles North Star. After this, Black God placed another set of stars near the North Star revolving female. Black God now turned to the east. He took five more stars and placed them in a pattern the Navajo call man with feet spread apart. Then he reached to the south and created first big one. Black God made three stars below it called rabbit tracks because the look is like the tracks a rabbit leaves in the snow. And then he made the first slender one. Black God placed several other constellations in the sky. Then he carefully made a copy of Dilyehe, the stars on his temple, to put in the sky. Black God decided to take a break he sat down to admire his work for a little while. When he looked up, he saw the shining stars, which would provide the people with rules to live on Earth. In the meantime, the coyote was silently watching the black god in action. The coyote was always hanging around, looking for trouble. He was a trickster, and gods hated him as he always meddled with their carefully organized plans. Coyote approached Black God and asked him if he could place a star in the sky. Black God immediately refused him. Coyote again begged Black God to allow him to place a star. Black God resisted, knowing Coyote's mischievous nature. 
coyote made his cutest face and kept insisting. Reluctantly, Black God gave him a star. Coyote, in his excitement, hurled it high up into the sky. This star turned red in color and began to wander. Black God was angry. The coyote had ruined his design. He was frustrated and sent the coyote away. Coyote was upset. He didn't think his star was so bad. In fact, he thought his star was better than the others. He wanted to prove it to Black God, so he returned to him. While the Black God was busy arranging the stars, Coyote crept up quietly and snatched the buckskin on which the stars were laid. The Black God saw this, and he ran to stop him. But before he could reach, the coyote ran in circles, wildly flinging the jewels into the dark sky. Soon, there were stars everywhere, too many for the people to count, let alone name them. Black God shrieked as his plans were ruined, while Coyote gleefully laughed as he bolted away. Now, he paused and looked squarely at Black God. The skies are beautiful. And having said that, Coyote ran off into the very first starry night. The stars were meant to guide the people, but now they had to discover their own. The star that Coyote placed later became known as the star without a month, or sometimes simply as the Coyote Star.